Good evening. Welcome to the Wednesday evening services at the Benton Church of Christ. We're glad you're here. Uh, I have a few announcements I'll read over. As far as the prayer list goes, uh, please continue to pray for families and students that were injured at the high school. We'd like to extend our sympathy to the family of Joyce Wilson, a member at Oak Level Church of Christ, sister-in-law of Judy Atkins, also uh, the mother of Denise Darden. Uh, and you can find the Darden's address on the bulletin board. Sympathy is also expressed to Beth Lance and the passing of her mother, Betty Matheny. A celebration of Betty's life will be held here at the building Sunday, February 11th from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Mason Cosner is home from Vanderbilt and is making progress each day. His address is on the bulletin board. Tammy Rudd had a procedure done for migraines in Dallas uh, January 29th. She is doing well and will be coming home at the end of the week. Also, please continue to pray for Misty Campbell, Shelma Collins, Judy Atkins, and Utah Frizzell. General announcements. Uh, the elders changed the date of our annual corporate meeting. It'll be Sunday, February 4th. And all classes, middle school and up, will stay in the auditorium. The elders encourage everyone to attend this meeting as they will be discussing updates on the building and also our security system. There are several kid, kids' shirts from previous Bible bowls and church camps that we need to find a home for. They're on the table out in the foyer, and you can take one home uh, for free. Also, if you're missing a dish or a cooking utensil, they could also be on the table in the foyer, so check those too. Cecil Spiceland has moved to the Calvert City Convalescent Center, room 216. Uh, the church is in need for a good used wheelchair. If you have a ch wheelchair and know of someone that does, please, please call the office or see Sonny Rommelman. Uh, and if you would like to order a Marshall Strong Benton Church of Christ uh, t-shirt, please sign up. There's a sheet in the foyer that you can sign for that. The deadline is Sunday, February 4th, or uh, you can see Nathan for your payment. For the youth group, February 4th, They'll be going to the nursing home at 345 and then have a Super Bowl party afterwards. February 9th, um, BNB, whatever that is, at 7 a.m. at Marshall County High School. And then CYC is, uh, you can sign up, you can still sign up for CYC, uh, and that's February 23rd through 25th. Uh, you can see Nathan for more information on that. At this time, please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this day and for this time that we can come together and worship you. We ask that you continue to be with all those who suffered injuries uh, last week at the high school, be with their families, be with everyone in the community at this time. Please give us all comfort and give us strength and guidance and be with all of us. Lord, we ask that you be with those that I just mentioned on the prayer list, some have lost loved ones and some are dealing with health issues. Please just be with them. Please go with us through the remainder of this service and into our classes. Be with us for the remainder of the week. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing, please. Let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich, let the blind say I can see, it's what the Lord has done in me. 
Tonight I want to start off by asking a question, especially in light of the events, the things that have happened within the last week. We've all contemplated and thought, well, what's the greatest thing that we have in this life? We've all been faced with the question, what is it that we've been blessed with that we might have taken for granted? The question I want to ask is, what's the greatest blessing of life? What is the greatest thing to you? And some might answer in different ways. Some might say financial security is their greatest blessing. And some might say that a close-knit family is their greatest blessing in this life. Some might say that the church is their greatest blessing of this life or the friendships that they have there. Uh, Some might say that their talents or their intelligence is their greatest blessing in this life. And in different stages of life, we may respond in different ways, but what I want to say, especially tonight after what we've experienced this past week, the greatest blessing of this life is knowing God is with us. 1 John chapter 4, you get to the chapter 4 and it basically just one at one verse after the other tells us that this is how God is with us. And you read in verse 4, As it says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And then you'll scan through chapter 4 and you'll see over and over uh, again where there is this assurance that God is with you, that God abides with you. And so I ask the question, what is the greatest blessing? Why is this the greatest blessing? 2 Corinthians 1 in verse 3 tells us that he is the God of all comfort. And so having that assurance that God is with us provides us with a comfort. A young man who wasn't so sure about the existence of God was faced with a tragedy. And it was during that tragedy that he realized that true comfort and consolation doesn't exist for someone who doesn't believe in God. And to believe in a higher power and and to believe in in a God of all comfort actually provided peace in a moment of inner turmoil. Can you imagine going through tragedy and not being able to go to God with your, your hurt and your heartache? Can you imagine going through a difficult time in life and not being able to go to God or to read passages of comfort? The greatest blessing is knowing God is with us during all of this hurt and this pain and this this terrible time that we've experienced. But the second reason why knowing God is with us is the greatest blessing is because without God we have no hope. Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, 12 through 13 says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And what's so great tonight is the majority of us in here are able to say 
and, and read with confidence in verse 13 we, that, and know for sure that we have been brought near to God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, I would like for each individual here to be able to say that as well. For every individual that's here tonight to know that God is with you. To be comforted by God and to have a hope that only a child of God can have. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13, as we just read, talks about how that hope is within Christ. It is in Christ Jesus that we have that hope. And Romans 6 and verse 3 tells us that we are baptized into Christ. It's how we have our sins washed away. It's how we get placed in Christ. And back in John, in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 15, John tells us whoever confesses God abides in him. And there's that idea of knowing God is with us. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1 says... In everyone who believes has been born of God. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. A godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation. Tonight I simply ask the question. Do you have the greatest blessing of this life? And knowing God is with you. If not, we ask that you obey him. That you would read his word, that you would obey his commandments. If we can help you at any time, we ask that you come now as we stand and we sing.
All right, we are ready to get started and move our way along. We, um, I was supposed to pass this around. I usually forget passing stuff around like I did Sunday, but I'm going to remember this time. Uh, Nathan Pirtle and maybe some others, the teenagers, came up with this shirt. It's Marshall Strong, Benton Church of Christ, and it has the different verses. Uh, each person in the youth group or several people in the youth group came up with scriptures to, uh, to, uh, for the, everybody to dwell on and think through when they were doing their little texting back and forth. And so they've made that into a shirt, and it's a church-wide shirt. It says, Marshall Strong, Benton Church of Christ, in the shape of Kentucky. And so I'm going to pass that around. Uh, the shirt, it says, is $25, and you need to put your name, your size, from small to 3XL, and deadline is February 4th. So there you go. And if this is too steep for you, we got a lot of free shirts in the foyer as well. Um, I think... With all the cleaning and building and everything else, we've run across a lot of stuff that, you know, I'll start here, Van, and just pass it back. We, we keep finding stuff in the building here and there with uh, stuff, and so um, those are Bible Bow shirts that are in the foyer from, I think, the last three or four years. And so if you want one of those, they, they're still scriptural, I guess the verses are. All right. Well, who do we need to remember on our uh, prayer list? Know of anybody directly offhand that we, that we failed to mention, failed to bring up? Okay, all right. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles. Psalm 19. Psalm 19, 1. And with the, uh, you know, as we're going through our Psalms, we're now to Psalm 19. So remember, we got to go through 150 of these critters. It's the longest book ever, but um, having fun so far. It's going well. So that's good stuff. And uh, so Psalm 19 is one of the passages we oftentimes will look toward when we're talking about proof that God exists. Um, the three of them are Psalm 14.1, Romans 1.20, and Psalm 19.1. Psalm 14.1 has always been called the April Fool's verse, right? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So we say April Fool's Day is the atheist day, right? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's Psalm 14, 1. You run over to Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. And that passage tells us that the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen by the things that are made. The invisible attributes of God are seen through his handiwork so that all people are without excuse. In other words, as you and I look at the sunset, as you and I look at the ocean, and as you and I look at the mountains, we can prove to ourselves that a God exists, right? God has to have existed or exist in order for this present world to be here. And we look at it from the big view like that, but then we get to the small view, and we look at the idea of um, how the eye works and how our bodies work and all that goes on with the different aspects of all those things that are there. The uh, working of the sodium ion in the uh, heartbeat and just how complicated that is and yet that chemical equation happens every time our heart beats several times a minute that's going on there you go even deeper and you see the complexity of dna uh, crick who is one of the persons who invented or he didn't invent he discovered the uh, double helix of the dna uh, looked at it and realized he needed a designer something like that was too complicated to have just happened to have just come together and so uh, there for a while, Crick was a believer or a proponent of a theory that aliens had come to this world and then somehow had planted life, and that's where life had started. Now, that takes more faith than saying God did it. Because every time you meet somebody who believes in that idea of evolution, the question to ask them is, where did that come from? Right? There's people. Where did that come from? Well, an earlier organism. Where did that come from? Well, an earlier organism. Where did that come from? Well, proteins that were laying on the ground. Where did that come from? Well, you know, there was a spark. Well, where did that come from? And you go back and back and back all the way to a big bang, and you still ask, well, where did that come from? There must be a source. There must be a designer. And so Romans 1.20 tells us that the invisible aspects of God are seen in the creation. All right, so here we are, Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament or the uh, outside the sky shows his handiwork. 
Day into day they utter speech, night into night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Do you see the power of that passage? Everybody on this earth, whether you speak Arabic, whether you speak Russian, whether you speak Spanish, whether you speak English, even if you speak Kentuckian, right? You see God. As we drove up tonight, if you were on time, you saw the sunset, and you saw God there speaking. If you have walked through the halls, you've seen people, you see God speaking. We see those things which are there. Turn in your Bibles to Acts 17. Acts 17 is just one of the best sermons ever. It's Paul on Mars Hill, and he is battling against the Stoics and Epicureans, the greatest philosophers of his day, and a matter of fact, of every day, just about. God in his providence made the church be established at the same time as the height of Greek philosophy. And so here we are. People today think, oh man, if you're a Christian, you got to be a redneck, you got to be uneducated. Christianity is just something that the masses who really don't know any better uh, believe in. What we see right here is Paul stands before the greatest philosophers of the day. He preaches the gospel, and there's really nothing they can do about it. Because the gospel makes more sense than what the Stoics and the Epicureans were able to think as well. And so, remember the Stoics, founded by Zeno? You remember all that from school, right? Stoa in Latin or Greek means a porch. That's where they met there in the Areopagus. The ideas of the Stoics are that, listen, life happens to you. There is nothing you can do. So what you need to do is be firm, have a stiff upper lip, and just endure it. It's going to happen, and there's nothing controlling it. Just be there, right? The Epicureans, in the other way, they thought, man, I can't do anything to control life, so it's going to be a roller coaster. I'm going to hop on and raise my hands and enjoy it. Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And so Paul's standing before those two, and he's preaching this gospel. Start reading, reading with me in verse 24. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, even though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our every being. All right, think about the implications of that, which is right there that we just looked at. Paul standing before the, the temples there in Athens. He says, listen, you know, you have an altar to an unknown God because there's more altars in this city of Athens than there are people. And he said, what you're doing is you're groping around looking for a God somewhere. And guess what? He's not far from you. He's right here. And he is the one who created the world, created every person from one blood. He is the one who controls the nations. He's the one who controls the politics. He is the one who pre-appoints the time when you're born and the time that you die. Dwell on that, thinking about the power of God which is there. Seeing creation. The power of the United States, power of the Soviet Union, power of um, Germany, power of all the nations through the world, controlled by God. The rise of good men, the rise of evil men, controlled by God. Everything that happens, controlled by God. And people are constantly groping and looking for meaning, looking for purpose, looking for a God. And Paul says, let me tell you, he is not far from any of us. He is right here. And so you see some fascinating stuff, which is there. Of course, if you notice in that first line there, seeing God in the skies, his glory, what Psalm 19 is about is three ways that you see God. And so this is how, if you're a preacher, you would organize it. So we'll see God for starting off looking at his glory. Looking there in verse 6, it's rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there's nothing hidden from the heat. Their line has gone through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In him he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. You know, right now it's cold outside, right? And so what do we wish for? Man, I wish it was July. Oh, if it was July, you know, we wouldn't have to wear all these heavy sweaters. I wouldn't be shivering. It wouldn't be shaking. Life would be so great, Right? When July comes, what will we, will, 
what will we be longing for? Man, I wish it was January. <coughs> I wish we came to this time where we didn't have to, you know, didn't have to sweat all the time, and man, things would be so much better. We're just never satisfied with the um, weather that we've got. Well, here you see, think of, uh, think of David. He's out there with his sheep, and as he is up before dawn, making sure the sheep are safe, making sure that they're taken care of as they get up in the morning, he is beginning to watch the sun rise. And as he's writing a poem, he's waxing poetic. And as he watches the sun rise, he, he thinks of it as a bride coming down the aisle to her wedding. And you begin seeing just a glimpse of her in her you know, bridal attire, the wedding gown. And you see the beauty of her as she is coming down the aisle. And you see that going on. And as he sees his son going, he thinks, you know what? There's nothing that's hidden from the sun. Yes, you can burrow. Yes, you can get into a shade somewhere. But ultimately, when the sun comes out and the light appears, it brightens everything. David earlier had been in the darkness. In the darkness, you don't know where the wolves are. You don't know where the lions and the bears are. You don't know where anything is. You just hope that everything's okay because you can't see very far. And he knows once his son comes, he's going to be able to see everything from a distance. He's going to be able to know everything that's happening. Well, why does David write this? He's writing about God. And as you and I look at the creation, the existence of God, guess what we learn very quickly? You don't escape him. You don't escape him. Now, we think in our minds that we're in control. And we think in our minds that we've got everything going the way it should, right? And a lot of us, we don't say it intellectually, but we think it in our heart. We're going to live forever. Guess what? Unless the Lord returns first, eventually life will take its course and we'll leave. And life will take its course and our kids grow up. Life will take its course and our families will mature. Life will take its course, and many things in life change. Things we would never think would change. Many things in our life change. And as David is contemplating that fact, as he watches that sun comes up, he says, you know what? God's that way. God exposes this world. God is always, always, always there, without a doubt. Has everybody got the pass around? Did, did it ever go to this side? All right, so there. Check and see. Check the youngins. See if the youngins need some clothing in there. And so that's what you see there as you think about that. And so as you look at the first five verses, you see we can know God exists and we can meet who God is by looking at creation. Now we continue along a little bit. And you see there's a second way. Actually, Psalm 19 is divided into two. Tonight we'll look at it divided into three, but it's literally divided into two. First seven, you know God exists by creation. The last seven, you know God exists by the scriptures, right? And so the way that he likes to do this, and this is the way David works in his mind, is he likes to name things, all right? And so you've got six names for scripture, and each one of these names is going to be descriptive. Remember in the Old Testament, Names were descriptive. Now, if your name was descriptive, what would it be? Sometimes we play with Indian names, right? Running with wolves, whatever else it may be. Uh, what would your name be? What were some of the people in the uh, Old Testament named? Esau. What's the word Esau mean? Red and hairy. Now, tell me who doesn't want to be known as red and hairy, right? Okay. Huh? Yeah, you would like it? Yeah, it wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> it wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> There you go, that's true. <laughs> and so you look at a lot of names. Um, I've always, I think you see a lot when you look at Jacob and Leah and Rachel fighting back and forth. And you just imagine what those kids thought growing up when they got named what they named, were named, right? Gad means I now have a lot of kids, maybe my husband will love me. You know that kid had a first great first day of kindergarten, Right? Hey, what's your name? Well, hopefully my daddy loves me because I've had a lot of children. What? You know? But you go through those names, they're descriptive. Same here. First of all, the law of the Lord is perfect. 
converting the soul. The word perfect oftentimes in our minds, in Bible minds at least, means complete. What do you need to find salvation? The Bible. Right? You might have a pastor, you might have a preacher, you might have a parent, you might have a church, you may have a friend who tells you things. Well, how do you know that what they tell you is right? 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 reminds us, test the spirits to see if they are of God, right? What were the Bereans called noble because of in Acts 17? You remember? The Bereans were considered to be more noble because they read the word of God to see if what Paul preached was true. And so it's important for us to read God's word. The word of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, as you and I run through the Bible, we see that it is, it is an awesome, awesome book. You look at how it was written. It's written in many different cultures, the Egyptian culture, the Babylonian culture, the Roman culture, the Greek culture, the Israeli culture, all these different cultures, and yet it all comes together and it all is unified with the same point. It's fascinating. Forty men over around 1,600 years wrote the Bible, right? Can you get 40 guys to agree on one thing very often? Not very often. Usually somebody's going to be a dissenter and have a different opinion. But you begin running through the Bible, and not only do they agree on the major things, they agree on things we don't agree on. The role and the work of the Holy Spirit. The idea of the providence of God and how it works. The idea of theology and much of the questions of theology. Even though these people are from different ages, and even though these people are from different cultures, speaking different languages, the word of the Lord is perfect, and it converts the soul. What do we mean by converting the soul? Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Okay? The power of the gospel changes people. Now the man who wrote that, how was he changed by the gospel? Remember his earlier life? He had a different name. Yeah, he was a persecutor. He wrecked havoc in the church. He was a murderer. Later he would say, I am the chief of sinners. And yet the gospel transformed him from a sinner to a saint. But look at Peter, a man who just could not shut up a lot of times. You ever meet somebody like that? Nobody pointed at me. Just could not be quiet. And yet you begin reading First and Second Peter, you see a man who is very under control. A man who, even though he speaks, speaks under control to say precisely the things that need to be said. The word of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And the Bible works today just like it did back then. It converts us. It changes us into what God wants us to be. Romans 12, 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be changed, transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may see that which is a good, acceptable, perfect will of the Lord. All right, so the law converts us. Number two, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. All right, what do we mean by the word testimony? What is a testimony? It's a witness. witness. All right, can I get a witness? That's right. It is one person telling another person what has happened in their life. This is how God has affected me, and these are the things that have gone on in my situation. All right. Now, let's talk about something. Maybe it's controversial. I don't think it's controversial. You go to a lot of denominational churches, a lot of times there will be more of a witnessing aspect to it. People will stand up and say, this is how God has affected my life, and these are the things that have gone on. You run to the book of Acts. Paul does a lot of witnessing, right? Acts 9, you see what happens to him. He recounts the exact same story in Acts 22, and he recounts the same story again in Acts 26. He over and over is talking about, this is what happened to me, all right? Now, traditionally, in many churches of Christ, we don't have that witnessing aspect. We don't get up and talk about what God, how God has changed me. Traditionally, why is that the case? Where, as a body, do we traditionally want to put our focus and emphasis? On Christ, on the, on the Bible. Okay, it's not that we deny that there is a testimony within us and a changing within us, 
But generally, we tend to rely on Scripture. Follow Jesus. Follow Him. As we looked at two weeks ago in our Sunday morning lesson, in John chapter 2, verse 5, where Mary points to her son, Jesus, and says, whatever he has said to do, you go and do it. And so Paul was able to say in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. But really, remember, he was inspired. And each one of us are fallible. We make mistakes. And so there's an importance of looking at following Jesus and following the Bible. So in that aspect, is it wrong for us to witness and tell other people what Jesus means to us? You think? I think it's okay if you're having a conversation with an individual. Okay. Tell him how God has affected your life. Right, right. It's important for us to be able to witness our history and tell other people, hey, this is what's happened. But we can't let that be the emphasis. Because guess what? If you plant your faith in my story and what I've done... If you plant your faith in me, you're going to be sorely disappointed because I'm not perfect. Just ask my kids. I'm not perfect. And we're all going to fall short. And that's the reason we point and say, oh, trust in Jesus. Okay, so you got the law, you got the testimony, now you got, should be statutes. Is it statutes? Woohoo, it is. All right. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing in, yes, what do you got? Yes. It absolutely is. What she just said is you may not go door to door, you may not teach every day, but the way you live speaks volumes to what you're saying. That's what he said. Uh, David Thurman, I think, right? David Thurman. Gospel Minute started with Johnny Ramsey and Clem Thurman. And uh, Johnny's already gone on to his reward. Clem, I think, is close if he's not already there. And so Clem's son, David Thurman, I think, is doing it, if I'm not mistaken. That's true. That's true. Statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Okay. Statutes. Once again, we're looking back in the aspect of it being a law. This means it's the canon or uh, something that you can always trust in. Now, what would be an example of that? Let me tell you an example. When I get out on a boat, especially if it's in the Gulf, I haven't been on the ocean, I've just been on the Gulf, the whole world begins to do this, right? Now, I have never gotten seasick. I've been with a lot of people who have been seasick, but I've never gotten seasick. For some reason, my body does okay when it's going back and forth. But even though I'm not physically seasick, when I'm on that land and I get off that boat, it feels good, right? It's what we're used to is good, good stuff. And I think of those people back in the 1800s who used to hop on those boats and go for years. And I just think, wow, when they got back to land, what would it feel like? You know, it'd be so weird. You'd see them walking down the road doing this, I guess. I don't know, because that's what they're used to doing. That's the idea that we're bringing out here. The statutes of the Lord are right. The world changes. What the world says is good and righteous and important changes. Opinions change. But what doesn't change? God, right? Right? You pull somebody from the 1980s and pull them to today's world, what would they think as they look around? First and foremost, they'd be freaked out by our phones, right? Where do you put the cord, right? But then they would begin watching TV and watching movies and watching what everybody's opinion is on everything, and they'd say, what in the world have you done, you know? Or think if you go back to the 60s or the 50s. We're in a world where everything changes and goes in style and out of style. God's word is always there. And that's the reason it causes rejoicing in the heart. We have something we can hold to. Okay? The commandment of the Lord is pure. It enlightens the eyes. You think of the pure water which is there, and it allows you to see things in a much better way, a clearer way. Think when you uh, finally sleep or think if you're really, really famished, you finally have a good meal and now you can finally think clearly. Okay, He puts it that way. 
Now let's look at verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. That word fear can be translated for us as in a very strong, healthy respect. Okay? Um, I used to, a little bit in my younger days, play around with electricity a little bit. All right? 120 hertz, 220 hertz badly. Right? And you're supposed to touch it with this side of your hand and not this side of your hand. Because, you know, when you get lit up, as an electrician says, you know you know it very quickly, right? Well, you, the thing with electri- electricity work is once you get shocked, you don't want to do it again. You learn your lesson really quick. Because you respect it very, very well. In the old days, back when people used to get spankings... Kids would misbehave once, and then after that, you know, the mama can just let out a little ruler out of her purse or a fly swatter or whatever else it may be. Trish, what was it you had? You told me one time. Huh? You had a wooden spoon in your purse. Okay. She told me one time she had a wooden spoon in her purse. That's why all of her kids act so well. She would wave that spoon in church, right? All right. And probably a lot of people are that way. Well, it, it, it creates a healthy respect that's there. And so that's what he's talking about, the fear of the Lord. Well, it's clean. It endures forever. It creates a cleanness within us. All right? Now the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. God's in charge, and that is a wonderful, great, and good thing. And so what David's doing is he is labeling and giving different names as he's going through. Think of this as being the chorus of the song which he's singing He's going through these names, the law, the testimony, the statutes, commandments, fear, judgment. And he says, hey, they convert me. They make me wise. They make me happy. They open my eyes. They last forever, and they're righteous. See how all those work together? Okay. Then he continues talking about the uh, word of God here. And he says, God's word, the scriptures, more to be desired are they than gold. Yes, even more than fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is worn, and in keeping them there is great reward. All right, David's time, what was the most valuable thing that's there? In his day, it would be gold. Gold was the top notch. Today, maybe we think U.S. currency. Maybe modern people would say, oh, there's Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin's pretty awesome. It doesn't really exist, but people pretend it exists, so, you know, it's it's really neat. Well, David says, God's word is worth more than all the entire world. All the gold of the world, all the money of the world, that's how much I love the word of God. Now, remember back in David's time, they didn't have sugar. Sugar wasn't invented until much, much later. I think sugar was invented in Central America, brought to Europe, and then all the Europeans lost their teeth because of it. All right? What was the sweetest thing back in this day? Honey. Honey was the sweetest thing you could eat. And so David says, you know, the Bible to me, Scripture to me, is worth more than all the gold in the world, and it's worth more than all the candy which I've ever had. The sweetest, wonderfulest, greatest thing that has ever, ever been there. And so you see those wonderful, wonderful thing which is there as he describes it. Now, looking at my life, looking at your life, looking at the actions which you do, how much Bible reading you do and how closely you follow it, where would you rank the Bible? Is it worth more than all the wood in the world? (laughs) Worth more than all the money in the world? How do you show by your actions the importance of the Bible in your life? How sweet is it to you? Is there something you'd really rather be doing than being in Scripture and looking at it? Sometimes there needs to be a little bit of conversion there, a little bit of faithfulness as well. We do. We take it for granted. And we don't realize how precious and special it is. We we certainly don't realize that at all. Well, you see the life life of people... The life, the life of the Bible and people, that's where you witness to see it. That's right. You see the life of the Bible in the actions of people. Now, let's talk about this for a second. The Bible never teaches in Scripture. There's not a verse that says you must read your Bible every day. 
right? We act like there is, and it's a good idea for you to read your Bible every day. But the Bible has a long history. And guess what? People didn't own Bibles until just recently. Um, For the longest time, churches would just exchange back and forth letters, such as Romans, such as Matthew, and things such as that. It's come out in the last couple of years that the book of Romans, when it was written, just the parchment and the ink and the expertise that was required, just the materials would cost in Roman days, the days of Paul, about the cost of a used car, somewhere in the range of like $4,500 in modern times, modern terms of money. So not everybody had a Bible because not everybody had that kind of money to throw around. Now, of course, it was put together and many churches worked together to have Bibles and it was translated in many different languages. But as recently as just the late 1500s, early 1600s, you'd have Tyndale and other people who, as they would, as they would write the Bible into English... It upset many of the people in the state church so much that people could check them out, you know, check out and see what was being written was true. Tyndale was burned at the stake just 400 years ago for the thought of making sure that people could actually read the Bible. For the next 100 years, not many Bibles were around, but the ones that were there were chained to the pulpit. And you almost had to have a license from the church in order to be able to get to that Bible to read what was in there. Now, Gutenberg created the uh, modern-day printing press. Luther helped in the promulgation of the Bible, going through there in Gutenberg with the press. And so in the last 100 years, 200 years, now we have Bibles. And guess what? The other day I counted, I have 32 Bibles. All right? Now, one of the reasons I have 32 Bibles is because I'm always losing everything. And so if you have enough Bibles, you have one at every spot, so you never lose it. You just, one's put away somewhere, and you'll find it later. But I'm sure that you, looking at your life, as a matter of fact, I got stopped in Jackson, Mississippi one time when I was driving to go visit somebody. I was in a bad part of town because that's where our visitor was from. Got pulled over, and the uh, policeman said, he, he put me in the back of his car, and he started searching my car. And um, later I asked him, what in the world? He said, nobody has that many Bibles. And uh, he was convinced that I had somehow was, had put drugs into those Bibles, and that was how I was distributing it around there. Because I was, you know, the wrong skin color to be in that part of town, and he just thought, I must be doing something wrong. And I said, no, I'm just, I just can't keep up with my Bibles. That's why I have so many. But he just could not understand why somebody had that many Bibles in the back of their car. I guess it's a good thing to be arrested for. Probably the first person ever to almost get arrested for having too many Bibles. But anyway, I, I don't care about that story. Weird stories happen to people. All right, um, but looking at this, you own a lot of Bibles. Sometimes people have their church Bible sits on their pew. Sometimes you'll have your Bible at home. But how much do you appreciate it? And just as Bill said, the way you show that you appreciate it is not by the quoting of Scripture, but by the way that you apply it to life. Can people tell in the way that you treat your family, I'm a Christian? Can people tell you're a Christian by the way you act at work, and the way you forgive, and the way in which you love other people? There's nothing that compares to the beauty and life that's given by the Scripture. Okay, now our last two, as we go near the end, this may be an artificial division, because most people say the uh, psalm divides into two. First, you see the creation. Second, you see Scripture. I think for tonight's purpose, we can kind of divide it into three. How do you know God's there? By creation, by scripture, thirdly, by grace. And what I mean by that is the effect that plays upon our life. What is the reflection of God in you? Look at verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins and let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. All right, who even knows their errors? All right, many years ago, I was at a church camp, and a guy preached a sermon at church camp, and I thought that's the worst sermon ever for church camp because it was really deep. Nobody wants to get deep in church camp, right? You're sweating, you're hot, and you're trying to talk a girl into walking to a cabin or something with you, right? All right, so that's what you care about. Here's what his sermon was on, covetousness. You know, whatever world that was at church camp. 
But the reason I remember that sermon all these years later is he said, oh, let me guarantee you something. He said, you will preach for 100 years and you'll never have anybody come forward and repent of covetousness. Now watch, somebody will do it this next Sunday. But think about that. Covetousness is the worst sin that's happening in the U.S. When's the last time you saw somebody publicly repent of covetousness? Have you seen it? Maybe. As we go here, covetousness is very closely related to pride. And what David says is the sin that all of us are guilty of, but nobody can see. We don't see ourselves as prideful. We see everybody else as prideful. We don't see ourselves as covetous. We see everybody else as being covetous. The one sin that nobody can see, guess what? The Bible lights it up in us clearly. How do I know that God exists? Because He lights my soul up and He shows me where I'm coming short. When I read God's Word and when I hear it preached and when I see it, the example given from everybody else, it shows me in my heart, Mark, this is what needs to be worked on. This is what's keeping you from God. This is how you need to change. And so as you and I think about this, we see, I know God exists because I learn quickly, I'm not perfect. Now you talk to an atheistic person, a person who does not believe in God, he's going to tell you more or less he's perfect because he has no standard to go against. He's going to say, well, of course, I need to change this or change that because he'll try to create some moral relativism or some moral standard even though he can't define where it comes from. But he's not going to have those needs and issues in his life lit up like we do. And so I know God exists because I know that I'm not God. Does that make sense? That may be weird on my part. And sometimes my mind does go in weird places. But that's what you see there. You see the power of that going on. Now, one more, and I think we're done. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O God, my Lord, my strength, and my Redeemer. You remember that song? It's in our songbook. Sometimes we sing it. It's kind of a chant. All right. Our lives and our words are to be a living sacrifice to God. The sharp sword of the Spirit carves us, shapes us, molds us to be what God wants us to be. All right, so as we look at this psalm, what are some things that you see that we pointed out? When somebody says Psalm 19, what do you think about? God is everywhere. God is everywhere, yes. He comes out like the sun and lights everything up. All right, the bridegroom idea, good. I always think of that first verse because that's what I have memorized, right? Heavens declare the glory of God. All right. All right, thank you for being here. See you Sunday. Oh, did we ever announce that? If you leave the auditorium, we love you, but don't come back till Sunday. Uh, the reason for that, um, they're cutting sheetrock back here, so there is dust everywhere. And I think a couple of guys were up here mopping and sweeping the uh, foyer, but there's dust everywhere. As soon as it gets in the carpet here, it won't be green anymore or blue. Or what color is this? Is it green? Okay, it won't be green any longer. 